Welcome to a regular monthly meeting of the Princeton Historic Preservation Commission being held electronically via Zoom on June 20th, 2022 at 4 p.m. Pursuant to section 13 of the Open Public Meetings Act, adequate notice of the time and place and agenda of this meeting um, has been noticed by transmitting a copy to the Princeton Packet, Town Topics, The Times, Trentonian, and by filing a copy with the clerk of Princeton, uh, www.princetonnj.gov slash meetings, pursuant to Executive Order 107 due to the state of emergency in New Jersey regarding COVID-19. Notice that during the declared state of emergency, all regular and special meetings of the Princeton Historic Preservation Commission will be held electronically via Zoom. Such notices have been placed on the official bulletin board at the municipal complex and are on the Princeton website and are maintained throughout the year. Thanks for coming. I see Leighton. I see David. This is good. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, everybody. Um, Hi, Leighton. Hey, hey, Elric's here. Excellent. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. Do you want to take the roll? Of course. Um, Ms. Capazzoli? I'm here. Mr. Shore? David, you're muted. He's probably getting his set up. Here he goes. I'm here. Thank you. <gasps> Mr. Endersby? I'm here. What do you know? <laughs> Ms. Satterfield? Here. Mr. Shatskin? Here. Ms. Howard? Here. Mr. Pyle? Absent. Okay. We have a quorum. Thank you. And I apologize to anybody um, who's coming in because a lot of people had trouble with the link. So, um, Anyway, hopefully we'll get that resolved for next time. Um, Elizabeth, do you have any announcements? Um, I do not have any announcements. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, I, I don't really either. Um, we have minutes from May 23rd, um, which was last month. Um, I thought they were great. I didn't have any changes. Um, does anyone have any changes to those minutes? and? If not, does somebody want to move to approve those? Madam Chair, I just have one minor change to page four, which is the first paragraph under B and the second sentence. I think there's just a, an additional uh, word has been in a change, probably has been a change. Okay. So it okay. just needs to be removed. Okay. Anything else? All right, does someone want to move approval? So moved. Thanks, Roger. Second? Second. Uh, thanks, Shirley. <laughs> okay, where's Elric going? <laughs> anyway, I'm sure I'll, he's fine with it. Um, all in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carried. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, I have a question um, on the resolutions for 220 John Street. Uh, no, no 220, it's just, we only have 335. That's right, okay. Because 220 John has to go to zoning first before yes. we can pass the resolution. And we just, have right. the, we just had your memo that was signed right. and sent right. over to them. That's, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that. Okay. So um, we'll just, uh, so we just have the resolution for 335 Nassau Street. Um, is there, Someone who'd like to move to approve that? Madam Chair, um, yeah. I, did, I did get an email from the applicant, Kathy Knight. She did request a small change on page two. I think there's some feedback coming in. Yeah. yeah I'm, trying, I'm trying to fix this. Oh, okay. 
Um, she had asked for a change on page two under uh, item four, halfway down where it starts windows will be installed on the front facade and a slider window. She said that that should be a fixed window. Um, she, I think that she had talked about the fact that they were too high. And so she decided to make them all fixed. So um, that's the only correction she would like made on that resolution. Okay, I don't think that's a big deal. <laughs> So fixed instead of sliding. Slider, right. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So would anyone um, like to make a motion to approve that with that change? So moved. Thanks, Frida. Second. Second? Uh, thank you, Roger. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> motion carried <laughs> thank you all right so we're moving on to our first application which is actually the municipality um is anybody justin are you gonna help with this or um we're gonna bring over i believe that jim purcell is here um okay and I'm just seeing if there's anyone else. I Oh, here's Ian Baker also. We'll bring him over. Okay. Ian Baker, Bill Piontek. Bill Piontek. Yeah, see. William. It's probably under William, let me see. Uh, I'm I see him. You know, he's not here maybe yet. But Ian should be here. Yeah, Ian. Right. I, see, yep. I see I'm Ian. Here. Okay. All right, and um, we did get the plans. So hopefully everybody got a chance to look at the two bridges that are being replaced. Hello, Tom. Hello. Welcome. Hi, Tom. Sorry to be late. Welcome. That's OK. So we're reviewing um, uh, the municipal um, replacement rehabilitation of two historic stone arch footbridges foot bridges in uh, Mountain Lakes. Um, and we, we did receive the, the plans and elevations and uh, the report from Hunter Research, which was excellent. Um, so I don't know, Elizabeth, did you want to say anything about the project? No, I, you know, I'm going to defer it to, uh, to Jim for him to talk about. Um, and I think he probably can do a very good job to update. And, and I'm actually going to defer it to Ian since he's the uh, <laughs> principal engineer on uh, the project. Okay. Um, we were hoping that uh, our consultant, Bill Piontek from, uh, <coughs> from FBA. 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 <laughs> Sorry, I have COVID brain. <coughs> um, yeah, COVID fog, I guess. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping that Bill shows up, uh, so we'll keep an eye out for him. But I'll let uh, Ian introduce the project. Yeah, so we are scheduled to replace uh, two pedestrian footbridges in Mountain Lakes. Um, I guess we received a grant from the NJ Historic Trust uh, to do these two bridges. Uh, the first one is the Red Trail Bridge. Uh, that bridge is about 20 feet wide um, and it's about 60 feet long and it is uh, I, I guess an old masonry bridge that a tributary to the I guess it's tributary towards the Stony Brook flows underneath of it. Um, I guess what uh, brought this to our attention is we have the, the local group Topos uh, noticed that some of the parapet walls were deteriorating and the masonry on those parapet walls was failing. Um, we also have the Green Trail footbridge, which is a much smaller pedestrian footbridge, only about three feet wide and um, let's see, I think it's 12 feet long. Uh, it is crossing a stream between some of the settling ponds. So Mountain Lakes has the, the dam across it and the larger lake is the, the larger settling pond. And 
north of there, there are much smaller dams and much smaller settling ponds. And this happens to be the, uh, the Green Trail footbridge that went from the old uh, Mountain Lakes house um, to some of the, the trails. And I believe there used to be some old structures um, that are no longer there, no longer present. Um, in both instances, we're looking to um, completely disassemble the bridges um, and then rebuild them in kind. Uh, of course, there's gonna be some structural uh, additions at the, the base of both of these bridges, but um, the intent is to preserve the historic nature of them and put back every stone in its exact location as it is today. Uh, let's see, the Red Trail footbridge, we're also going to add a pedestrian railing um, down the center of the bridge. So it'll be like a 10 or 11 foot wide multi-use path. And the, the green trail is, is just what it is today. It's just gonna be a simple three foot wide pedestrian bridge, but it'll be fully, uh, I guess it'll be structurally intact after this project. Um, Ian, I know that there was an email that was sent out from Robert Von Zumbush, and I'm not sure if um, uh, Bill had sent him uh, the report and everything. I don't know if it's because he sits on Friends of Princeton Open Space or, or whatever, um, or if it was just for courtesy, but I think one of the comments that he had made is that the, the wood railing that he had recommended um, a metal, more, more linear streamline, less visible. Um, okay. I'm not, again, I'm not sure yes. Uh, yes. what Robert's capacity was for that review. It might've been because he was um, doing that for Friends of Princeton Open Space. I'm not sure. Jim, maybe oh, I'll, you know. I'll, I'll jump in, Elizabeth, that- um, oh, Got two microphones on. Um, yeah. Uh, Robert had suggested that instead of the wood railing, we have a uh, black powder coated metal railing. Um, we have no objection to that if that is the uh, wish of the HPC. It would be a, a smaller profile, um, more streamlined and, and uh, probably more historically significant. I, I think it sounds like a good idea to do metal if we can. I mean, it might last longer too. That's, yes, it would. <clears throat> Yeah, so it seems like a good idea. I have a question about the stone. If Ian, if there's um, any trouble, like let's say some stones break, uh, do you have any resources for replacement masonry or? Um, I, I'm, I don't have too much experience in the past, but I guess from what I've heard, like what we did when we built the Mountain Lakes Dam, I think we had to kind of like source a quarry that would have replicated the stones from that time period and also try to replicate uh, the color as close as we could. Um, but maybe maybe Elizabeth remembers that what was done for the Mountain Lakes Dam. Um, um, Elric. Elric does, Elric does. <laughs> um, well, I have some experience with Princeton Bridges, but. I've also built a lot of stone walls and um, you can number the stones, but fitting them all back together is not an easy task. And, and I guess my principal question would be, is, are you gonna use the full depth of the stones or are you gonna cut them back to a certain depth and reinforce the in interior of the walls with concrete as has happened on some of the other bridges? Uh, I believe that you know, at least for the any of the, the stones that are that are visible from the outside, I believe they're going to try to put them back in the exact same place as much as possible, and uh, anything behind them will be in fact structural, reinforced with concrete and rebar or anything like that. Well, the the, the, the one of the one of the difficulties in fitting all these things back together again is that one stone sits on the next, on the next, on the next. And so many of the exterior, many if not all of the exterior stones are going to be resting in part on stones which are not visible and are not going to be put back into place. 
which means you've got to you've got to substitute something else to make it to make it substantial i think right uh, I, I question your masons on 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 that because um it, it it is it definitely can change the character of the of the of the stone despite best intentions sure and it is not it's not like a dry laid stone it is uh, it, it is all mortared in place as as it is and all the mortar unfortunately if you go there today that mortar has just fallen apart or disintegrated over time so the intent i believe when it goes all back in place is to put mortar back in as a word to the commission um i think that one reason why our efforts over the stony brook bridge um have been well received you can see it behind elizabeth um is the fact that we had uh keith childs as our consultant and um if possible, I'd like to recommend that, I'd like to recommend and if possible, you will agree that we might reach out to him again in this, in, for this particular project. Sure, when we can, but it is gonna be publicly bid. So he has, he will have to, you know, submit, um, you know, a bid package for the work. It's not like we can pick and choose, unfortunately. And so um, just so I don't know, know how we, how we managed that the last time, but I'd look into that. So okay. just so you know that actually Keith Childs was brought in early on in the project, even before we had applied for the grant, just to look at the work um, and see what it entailed, how much work and what cost. Um, but then I believe what happened is, and there was an opportunity to apply for a grant. And so that kind of got sidestepped. And I think that what El Elric is, referring to is one, perhaps if you don't have a Mason's doing the work to bid on it. The second is what um, um, Keith did for HPC was he was HPC's consultant and the state actually had their own Mason and, and Keith had actually given advice to HPC and worked very well with the, the NJTP's uh, Mason's together. So I think those are two separate things that Elric might be talking yeah, about. That, that's correct. And, and the final and the other thing is that you, I believe this because we've worked on both sides of this issue as a as contractors and as consultants. Um, I think you can bid you can build into the bid package the 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 request that that the prospective contractor demonstrate that they've worked with other historic other historic uh, masonry. Sure, absolutely. Um, Elric, just to add to your comment that you made about how are the stones going to be laid, um, from reading Hunter's report, it appears that the bridge at the Green Trail is actually a stone facade, unlike the, the historic um, Stone Arch Bridge on the Red Trail. I didn't pick that up, but that's, a, that's, that's a valuable information. I had a quick question. Um, to my untrained eye, the uh, stream bank to the east of the bridge has been totally recontoured after Ida. I don't wonder if there's going to be any uh, attention. Do we have any grant money to look at uh, the bank contour in terms of future uh, impacts on the bridge? Yes. So that is, it's it's kind of, um, it is shown on the plans. Um, the plan view of the Red Trail Bridge does show that there will be, um, I guess, a sandbar removed to try to realign that stream because as it's flowing today, it's flowing directly into, I guess, what I'll call um, the the south <laughs> abutment of the bridge. So it's flowing directly into the, the wall of the, the bridge, which is not ideal. So we're going to redirect that stream um, so that it's flowing directly underneath the uh, the stone arch bridge yeah i was talking about the uh, the green trail bridge i, I know that Fopos is doing a whole bunch of uh, a lake uh, embankment work or i think they're doing or I read about it don't know it firsthand um but i'm, I'm more concerned about the the the, uh, the way the bank has changed leading the i guess it's mountain brook into under under the the Green Trail Bridge. Right. Well, I know we're going to be installing um, abutment foundations for either end of that smaller pedestrian bridge. 
Um, and I, I think I'm not, I'm, I know the plans aren't completely finalized yet, right? They're still draft plans, but right. I believe the treatment would use some sort of like riprap to try to stabilize the stone. Uh, I'm sorry, to stabilize the embankment um, in the event future storms like, you know, Ida and other hurricanes. Yeah, that worked yeah. Uh, closer to the lower, the, the lower dam. The riprap seemed intact. Okay. Yeah. At, uh, well, the, yeah, this is Bill Piontek from, uh, yeah, hi. Sorry, I, I had trouble. I've been trying since four o'clock trying to get on, but uh, luckily- Sorry, yeah, a lot of us had trouble today. So that's okay. okay. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, sorry about that. But uh, yeah, what the, uh, on the Green Trail Bridge, what the hunter found was that uh, there's some hand-placed stones in the stream bed. So uh, they think that that may be a you know a historic resource there. So if we encounter any of that, that we're supposed to document it and then and then put the stones back into place. Now I didn't see anything on a bank, but uh, but yeah, during construction up. Uh, um, see, I don't know whether Shippo would want. Uh, want riprap on on the you know on on the on the slopes i mean maybe maybe like the hand placed stones we can go up the bank and show that um that might look better yeah okay yeah, and, and i believe that's what ian meant by riprap is hand yeah. placing hand placing some some stones to protect the embankment right uh, okay. and that's that's by the wooden bridge right Ian, is there, or is it one of the stone bridges? Lost the end. I think what, he's I, there. I, I'm, 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 I'm always confused about which trail's green, which one's red, which one's <laughs> yeah. which well, the, ABC. The, I think the, the red trail bridge is, it's much larger right. than the green trail. I think the green trail is a little small one and the red trail is the bigger, much bigger bridge. Yeah, that, that's right. The red trail is the stone arch, the historic stone arch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that and that bridge seems to date from the late 1800s, like 1880s, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it was believed to be in existence when when the Princeton Ice Company was. Uh, they were probably running their trucks over the. Well, not the the, the horse. I mean, uh, to carry the ice, they, they crossed that bridge. So. Uh, um, Bill, yeah. you said that there was hand laid stone um, on the bottom of the bed and you and, and you feel that you can still use them instead of riprap that you'll be able to use them in the same um, location? Uh, yeah, the way that uh, Hunter Research wrote their uh, wrote their study was that uh, if any of, they they feel that those hand placed stones on the, on the stream bed that they saw may be a historic resource. So so if we encounter them, we're supposed to document them and then uh, and then put them back. Um, they may have washed away along the you know along the banks, but uh, uh um, I mean, we can we can try to use a uh, riprap if that's if that's acceptable, or or if the commission would want us to use hand placed stones, we can do that also. I, I think that riprap actually has a very different look than the hand placed stone. I mean, it's right. pretty um, industrial almost. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what the other commission members are Oh Yeah, I think the hand placed stones would look a lot more appropriate. Okay. Um, do that. Okay. And, yeah, then, no, like, and then the, the other thing I was just gonna um, ask about was the railing, but it sounds like if we can do that black powder coated metal railing, um, that sounds like that would 
be a better solution than the, you know, pressure, the treated wood railing. Yeah. Now, now that's on the red trail, the historic stone arch. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. Okay. Um, there's two options. One is to use, uh, now the railing has to be three foot six inch high, and mm -hmm. that's to meet AASHTO requirement. Um, and, and we have to, like a six inch sphere cannot fit through any portion of the railing. So we could either go with, uh, with vertical pickets or, or like a three rail, horizontal rail with, uh, with wire mesh you know, to uh, wire mesh like welded to the rail. So I don't know what the commission would, uh, uh, what, their, what your feeling is about which Bill, type of rail. Do you have any of those that you could uh, share on the screen? Um, yeah, let me see. Yeah, all right. Um, I'm speak for myself. Uh, I think that what I, I think I would object to the to the pickets um, because yeah. they have a personality all their own, and we're introducing something which was never there. The thing uh -huh. with the with the with the rail and something like the wire mesh below it. <clears throat> It looks. It just looks like a, a um, something which it, it is is a contemporary solution, and it, and it doesn't try to be something that never was. Um, I don't know how other people feel. I I definitely agree with Elric. I feel like the horizontal three rails seem like a much simpler solution and not as you know cumbersome. Um, yeah. Probably last longer. Okay. I just say we've we've used the, the the reason why I bring up the mesh is that we've used that in barns where you have to have if you're going to have a loft because it the pickets just would never have been in a barn. Um, the rails are fine, but I know with with uh, we have problems with uh, uh, building inspectors considering kids climbing up over the rails in a loft and and jumping down to the floor level, that wouldn't be a problem with the with that central railing. So you probably could get that through. But again, it's it would be unobtrusive by comparison to the pickets, in my view. Okay. Are there other comments, suggestions? Um, I agree with uh, Elric and, and Julie. Okay. Thanks, David. Yeah, what, what I'll do is I'll work up a detail and then, I, then I'll submit it to, uh, to the municipality. Well, that sounds good. It's very news that these bridges are going to be rebuilt. And we want to um, express our gratitude, not only to the municipality, but to Robert Von Zumbush, who was instrumental, I think, in getting us the grant. So... Yeah. If Robert sees this, thanks, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> we miss you. Yeah, yeah. we miss we you. Do. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I actually saw him at the Historic Preservation Conference in Trenton. So I was talking oh. to him. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Well, Robert was very, very involved in the initial um, work done on mountain lakes so he's very familiar with those bridges right. yeah 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 him and i worked to, together on a lot of the project uh, oh, okay. yeah it was i do uh, i'm yeah. looking at i just looked at my latest mountain lakes map and to me it looks like they're both on the green trail both bridges maybe that's why we're confused ian shaking his head no um unless i'm Totally confused about uh, which bridges are involved. Um, okay. The Green Trail is the one that is is the closest to the lake. It goes all around the lake. Uh, at Lake Shore, uh, and so for sure, the one past the Mountain Lakes House is on uh, the bridge past the Mountain Lakes House is on the Green Tail Trail, and unless I'm confused about the one that's falling down, uh, I think it's also on the green trail. 
Um, Roger, if you look at uh, Hunter's report, I don't know if you looked at it. He yeah, I did look at there. it. And so the red trail is the one closer to the parking lot. And you're correct about the green trail being closer to the upper part of the property, the lake. Well, uh, graph 14. Uh, there's figure three and then there's figure one and two, one, two, and three. They all kind of identify where the trails are, the green and red. All right, I will look at it again. And four and five, actually they have multiple. Sorry, six. Yeah, and I'm, I'm working off a full post map. <laughs> and, and, they, and they had some great photographs of the existing bridges too. So right. they, they definitely are, their character is very different. Whatever well, happened to the to the stone that from the wall, from the Worth's Mill wall that collapsed? I think it's still sitting in the water. Well, this might be a it might be a good um, uh, source. Do you know, Elizabeth, what happened after the mill collapsed during the hurricane? Yeah, I mean there was conversation of what they should do with it. I know that the NJDP and SHPO were discussing it um, and they weren't gonna give anything away until they decided what was appropriate for it. <laughs> and I haven't heard what that is yet. Well, my guess is still in the water. <laughs> I think so. So anyway hopefully it'll all work out with the stones but you know if if you need a couple that might be a good source <laughs> okay look <laughs> yeah one one thing on the on the red trail the historic stone arch uh there's evidence that it had a stone cap on the on the parapet right so uh patrick hoshberger from hunter thought that it might be those stones may be in the stream bed. But at, at the start of construction, we'll go around the site, you know, in the vicinity and collect all the all the stones and salvage whatever we can see. Um, but if we don't find those capstones, I don't know if anybody, you know, may have, if anybody may have taken them or uh or or if they are in, in the stream bed, but yeah, but we are going to put back a, a stone cap on the walls. Uh, that's that would be great. Yeah, that's great. No, I yeah. think this is wonderful work. I mean, really, really um, important work. And obviously, Mountain Lakes has been an important resource resource for the community. Right. And so, do you know what the time frame is for the for the work? Well, uh, we're we will be uh, submitting for permits and uh, probably probably next month and uh, and then it'll take a minimum of 90 days probably even 120 days 120 yep yeah probably 120 to get the permit um, so that's so we're looking at probably, I don't know if we would want to start it in the winter time or or wait till the the spring. Probably go out to bid during the winter and yeah. or the following spring. Okay. I see. Right. And then and then when it gets um, started, do you think it'll take just a several months or how long do you think it'll take? Um. It, it could take maybe eight or nine months. Okay. Um, so I didn't know if, when it does, maybe the municipality can put out some kind of noticing or community update so people know what's going on there. Right. Or you could use it as PR, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, oh, it is. And, and photos could be posted also. You know, like progress photos during during the construction, so they can see what's what's uh, going on with the project. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. 
Anyway, it sounds like it's all going to be next year, not this year. All right. Yeah. Well, I think that's our clock. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Did you not get the number? So, um, Ian and Jim, um, are you looking for something from HPC besides? I think that they had made two comments and. And I, I assume, unless someone speaks up, that they concur about the railing change and the, the, the hand laid stone in the, in the bed. Um, are you looking for them to be involved? Do you have someone who's going to review the, the, the stones that if they get replaced or the, the laying of the stones in the bed or the mortar color and the mix? Is that something that you're going to be taking care of? Uh, I imagine we'll probably be seeking, right? The contractor is going to generate the submittals. So we're talking spring 2023 at this point. They generate the submittals. And at that point, I guess we would seek the approval from uh, a, a committee or subcommittee um, just to make sure all the materials are up to the commission spec. Okay, so yeah, you'd want HPC and this, to review those details. And the, and the same with the railing. <clears throat> okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but, okay. But uh, yeah, Hunter will take. The, uh, they already took a mortar sample, and then that that sample can be sent out to a lab, and uh, you know, then we can get criteria from that from that sample for the color and uh, texture and yep. for the mortar composition. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that sounds good. That sounds okay. good. So prior sure. to final design, we'll be back here with, uh, or here or, or to a subcommittee of, of the HPC showing okay. the final, <laughs> final design. Is that acceptable? Okay. Sure. That's, that sounds good. All right. Now, now one thing I wanna, I mean, the, the red trail will have a railing on it. The, the green trail will not. Yeah, because that's, my under, that's my understanding from the proposal Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And uh, I also talked with Deanna also, and she agreed with that, that no, no railing on that. Okay. And anything, do you need anything else? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. All right. Well, we look forward to, uh, oh yeah, Roger, go ahead. For the record, I looked at the map. I'm now unconfused. I withdraw my stupid objection. Okay. <laughs> all right. That's all right. I get confused okay. because the red trail goes along the sewer line, sewer right away. And, right. and the green trail starts right there where it goes off. Thank, thank yeah. you, Roger, because I, I, I admitted earlier, I get confused too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we really appreciate this work. It's a great benefit to the whole community. And, um, you know, I think these are beautiful bridges and I'm glad we're doing it the right way. It sounds like a great project. So thanks, thanks very much. And thanks for talking to Robert too. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, I, right. I always like uh, working on projects in the Mountain Lakes Preserve. I always like going there on a, on a field visit. Oh nice, yeah. Nice place to go. It is. It's a great place to go. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. All, All right. right. Thank All you. Right. Okay. Take care. Yeah. All Thanks right. Take care. Lot. Thanks, All Ian. Right. Okay. Thanks, Jim. All right. Bye. 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 All right. Well, that's great news. Pretty, pretty good. Um, now we're looking at the application of 15-17 um, Edwards Place. Um, this is the um, Chabad Lubavitch on uh, Princeton campus. We already looked at this application in, was it April of 2021? Uh, I'm trying to remember when we approved yes. it. Yes. Right. So it should look very, very familiar. Um, and we approved this application. There's some small changes. I don't think they're huge. So Elizabeth, do you want to go over your report? Sure. Um, I believe that Kathy Knight and Dino, um, I think promote him. I see Kathy. Hi. Oh, there he is, Dino. Okay. 
just want to make sure that he made it over here. Um, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So the applicants, Rabbi Eaton, Ebb, and Giddy Webb, have filed an application to amend their previous approval. <laughs> and this, uh, this um, amendment is to increase the building height to accommodate mechanical equipment. And because of the increase in height, it does require variances. The site is identified as 1517 Edwards Place and is further known as Block 41.01, Lot 62 and 63 on the Princeton tax map in the former Borough R4 zone. The project site lies within the Mercer Hill Historic District um, of the Municipal Overlay Zoning Map and the State and National Register of Historic Places, the Princeton Historic District. Um, as everyone knows, this property is in type two overlay, um, which is um, view for visible parameters from the right of way and um, any new surface paint material, um, that type of thing. Um, because this application is in the, the jurisdiction of the zoning board, HBC does serve as, as advisory to them and a memo will be issued and presented to them at their meeting. So um, as Madam Chair had um, mentioned, the approval was granted to the applicant by the zoning board at their April 28th, 2021 meeting, which um, allowed a building expansion addition and other improvements um, more related to historic preservation, such as modifying the front porch, the front door, removal of shutters, adding dormers, changing the front entry, signage, and site, other site improvements. Um, at HPC's courtesy meeting on March 15th, 2021, um, the Historic Preservation Officer's Report, March 10th, 2021, revised was presented, and then the chair had presented her memo, which was dated March 26th, 2021. In addition, HPC granted demolition of the garage uh, in their resolution, which was adopted on April 19th, 2021. And all of those are included in your package as attachments. And as you know, it had to be separate attachments because the scanner wouldn't take everything all in one shot. So that's why you see it's two separate. Um, so the owner of the property is Abbot Lebovich on campus, Princeton Inc., which Rabbi Eaton Webb serves as president. Abbot is a nonprofit religious organization that supports Princeton University's Orthodox Jewish student community. So um, as you recall, there was that rear stair tower that was part of the original approval. Uh, and to accommodate a larger mechanical equipment, uh, the applicant is seeking to increase the tower height by slightly over three feet. And this is based on the required occupancy load and kitchen equipment needed in the building, housing the equipment internally, which was preferred by the applicant um, instead of mounting it on the exterior. So as you can see in the report, there's a detail of project improvements. Um, I just want to note that that increase in height is 3.1 inches. And in addition, um, the, um, the, the original height of the makeup air unit was 25, seven feet and the proposed is 31, seven inches, which is an increase of six feet. The tower is also getting longer, which means it's getting closer to the, the rear property by one foot 10 inches, not 10 feet. Um, I had spoken with the applicant's architect, Kathy Knight, this afternoon to go over some of these things. And she's going to address certain things that uh, she wants to clarify as far as like uh, the hand railing is remain the same. There isn't any additional changes, but she's going to address that when she um, has the opportunity to present. So um, just to go down to the comments, um, there's only a few the applicants should be prepared to discuss the reason for these changes, which Ms. Ms. Knight is going to do. Um, the applicant um, is also asked to show where the, the proposed um, fence is on top of the retaining wall on the site plan. Um, the landscape plan should be identified with species, quantity, size, and the applicant is also asked if there's any specific <coughs> measures that they're adding to this application beyond what they had originally. And that's all I have, Madam Chair. Okay, well, I guess I want to um, ask Kathy if you do you want to um, share your screen or start with the um, application. Um, thank you, Julie. Yes, I'd love to share my screen if that's possible. Yeah, yes, you're able to. Okay.
So I know many of you have seen this application before, but for anybody that hasn't, I just figured I'd start with just getting you oriented to the site um, very briefly. This is University Place. This is the University Bookstore. And this is Edwards Place here. The building is shown with this red dot over it. Um, there is no change proposed for the front elevation of the building, which is the south elevation. Um, this is the east side um, where you will only have this stair tower visible from about 200 feet away on University Place um, because you have this whole parking lot across to look at. Um, the rear elevation, there really isn't any um, view from a public way. Uh, it's the north elevation. And the, uh, the west side right here, the only view of the stair tower will be down kind of a narrow alley between our building and the building next door that's less than 30 feet wide. So I just wanted to get you oriented for where, how this uh, building sits on the site. Um, we are um, not really showing any proposal changes to the front elevation from what uh, was approved at the last meeting just over a year ago. So that's what the front of the building will look like. Um, the uh, drawings that were presented to you um, are, I'm starting with them right here, uh, starting with A1. And what we tried to do is just try and keep it simple and um, put side by side what was the original approval and what we have proposed. So can people see my screen? Does it help if I blow it up? Um, yeah, that, that's that better. Would. It's very simple. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So um, here's the site plan. This is on the right side is the proposed and on the left side is the original appro approval. So the area in question particularly is the stair tower in the back uh, rear corner of the, of the structure. On the original one, we miss one, you see a kind of a rendering of what the equipment was proposed for the roof. Um, and over here you see the new equipment, it's thinner, it's taller. And unfortunately, uh, we couldn't fit all of the equipment on the roof, so a piece of it had to go underneath, which I will show you on an elevation, which forced the roof, the stair tower to be taller. And we really didn't have another spot on the site to locate this equipment. So we do propose to keep it on the roof of the stair tower, just um, make it taller to accommodate it. We really weren't interested in trying to put it up on the main roof of the building. We felt that just wouldn't be the right thing to do. It would be too visible. Here it is tucked back in the back corner on a lower part of the roof. Um, and we still thought that was the right place for it. The other um, minor changes is as you come along this left side of the building, we always had the concrete driveway here, but we just ext proposing extending the concrete pavers right back to the stair, as opposed to before we were, had switched the material to a bluestone material. Um, there are some minor changes of the equipment in the back here. These are some new air conditioning equipment. Once the engineer got finished designing them, sizing them with a generator. And what we had before was three smaller units shown in the back corner here. Um, our original application had included a bike rack and we wanted to continue with the bike rack because the number of the students do use uh, bikes to get to the facility. So the bike rack has been moved from this back corner to this kind of front part right over here on this, on this plan. Um, as again, no changes proposed for the front, um, landscaping or porch or anything. Um, as you come down the right side, the ramp just had to extend a little bit. Once we worked out all the grades, we realized just to meet all the handicap codes, the ramp comes further a little bit. We also just decided to, it made more sense to just keep the same material going back here, not switching it to a different material. So we'll keep the same concrete um, pavers. And then the materials back here are all designed now to look like bluestone. So we're using a tile and we'll show you a picture um, coming up that's very much gonna look like bluestone. Originally this had been bluestone and this had been a Trex material proposed for here. And we actually think the quality, we've upgraded the quality by keeping it all tile without, we don't have any Trex on the project now. And it's a bluestone looking tile is what's proposed. Um, so I think that kind of summarized what changed from one to the next on the plan. Really it's, we're targeting really mostly the stair tower for the changes. 
Um, this is the elevation. This is the um, east side. This uh, wall will be about 200 feet back from the public way from University Place. Um, this is this. So this is the original facade of the building, as you can see right here, and you've probably all seen that. This is what's happening in the back with the new sunroom area and our upside, upper deck and our stair tower about uh, quite a ways back from there, step back. And if you look up here, what happened was here's our outdoor equipment, but this is inside a piece of equipment that the engineers um, couldn't work out a design without it. So that pushed the stair tower to be a little taller. Um, there really hasn't been any attention to make any difference in the handrail. We still have a dark oil bronze color aluminum handrail planned for there. Um, we changed slightly the window patterns, actually thinking that the window patterns looked better with the existing. We have slightly more mullions than we'd had in this one. We just thought it was a little bit better match. Um, and then the stair, the windows up here just changed slightly with the, with the scale of the tower. We, we just thought they were more appropriate, slight, sizing them slightly differently. Um, there was an exhaust fan shown here, and actually we think it's better to have moved it up and on back because it'll be further away from, from view from the ground um, where it's located, where it's proposed to be located now. Um, this side already has these three dormers, and if you remember, we're matching them on the other side, and these three dormers have always had um, casement windows made to look like double hung with a with a wider um, style in the center, a meeting rail. Um, and we need casement windows because they're egress from bedrooms. And when you go to the west side, you'll see that we've matched these and done the same thing on the west side with the same uh, windows. And that hasn't changed from the original application. Um, this is the uh, north elevation and this cannot be seen from a public way. But this is um, the original is shown here at the bottom and the, uh, and the taller version is shown here on the top with this piece of equipment that we needed to um, house inside our stair tower. Um, the window pattern was modified slightly. Um, actually part of it was we needed some bearing here for the way the structural engineer framed it, but you know, we, we felt that it looked appropriate for the building and we actually divided the windows slightly, slightly differently because we thought it was a little more sensitive to the original um, window patterns on the building. Um, the shed dormer is the same up here. The only difference is that we did eliminate this one window in the corner since you'd be kind of looking right into um, the tower enclosure. The, this is the west side. You'll just be able to barely see the end of this down an alley. You'll maybe catch a view of just this back end of it. Um, this is mostly the family entry uh, coming in here, although it can be used by others, but typically the family will be coming in this way. And um, this is just a view of the way we worked out the window pattern um, based on the taller tower. We've also um, shown a, uh, a different enclosure for the, um, to, to screen the roof equipment. And we put, a sim we put kind of a similar, more linear one around the trash enclosure. Um, the only, the, uh, unless there are any questions on the drawings, which I'm happy to address now, I was going to quickly go through the few pages of the addendum showing some of the pictures of the materials if the committee would like to see that. Are there any questions on the plans or elevations now? I don't think so. I, let's go on to the materials. Okay. hiding on my screen here. <laughs> So I see in Elizabeth's report, yeah, her second comment 
is the fence on top of the retaining wall. Um, I don't, I don't think we talked about that. Um, I'll show you a picture of what it looks like. Um, can you see this screen now? Yeah. Okay, great. So this is, um, let me just mag it up a little bit. This is the, um, well, we have a picture of that, Julie, that I'll get to um, coming up and I can go back to the site plan and show you where it, where it is shown in the site plan. Okay. Um, this is the same concrete paver we've always planned to use on the driveway and we've just extended it in a few locations into the walkways rather than changing the material to bluestone. Um, just to keep it a little bit more consistent to look. And um, it's more durable if anything ever needs to drive across it, um, it won't damage the walkway. Um, this was what we proposed for the trash enclosure. Um, we'd had this bottom, if you can see the bottom one here, we'd had that and we just thought it looked a little cleaner, horizontal. And this is what we proposed a similar design for the um, top of the, on the rear, property line where we have a retaining wall we've shown, oh, shown this okay way. okay so that's what yeah that's what Tom was okay. okay referring to um this is just a section through um a roof screen it will not be red um we're showing it in dark bronze um to to hide the uh equipment on the roof um and then for the terrace deck and ramp areas we've eliminated the trex product and we were just showing, and sorry, this always comes up the wrong way, but we're just showing something that's going to look like, um, um, I think I'll get it, there we go. It's to look like bluestone and it's a, um, it's a porcelain tile designed for outside use. So it's a thermal bluestone blue select. Oh. And then this is a rendering of the, um, this is what the equipment looks like. It's it's white colored. I'm not sure why it, it, it shows it this way, but it's it comes in a finished white, and it's um it's only about two feet wide. Um, this unit that's showing on going on the roof. So that's that was the end. Everything else, there's no other changes in any of the materials that we're proposing. Um, you know the the color of the stucco, the color of the windows. I mean, there were no other changes. It was really just just the things that I've itemized for you now. And then the only other thing was, um, yeah, Elizabeth talked about a landscape plan, but has the landscaping really changed since the application? Um, some of the, some of the uh, things did move, but in general, we have the same variety and the same quantity, and I'd be glad to update it and submit the updated landscape plan. Um, that's no problem. Um, it's really, it's going to be the same, uh, just like a tree moved, you know, a couple of things tweaked and moved around. But it hasn't changed from that approval. So it doesn't really um, warrant, I guess, our review if it hasn't changed. Well, Kathy, you might want to talk about the fence that you're removing right next to the parking area that you're going to actually um, add new planting, and I think we had talked about today, perhaps extending it back to the property line. Okay. Oh. Here we go, yeah. All right, so on the, let me just go back here on the site plan. So um, on the site plan, I, can you all see my site plan? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, there, there's an existing fence six foot high that runs down the property line on the east side. And we now have this uh, railing here and this terrace going up. So we've elected to remove the fence along there. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we will be glad to extend the, and, and Elizabeth mentioned to me, well, perhaps you could extend the landscaping back there and we, we'd be happy to extend the landscaping back there. We, didn't, we did not show that. 
Um, but but it just didn't feel like it felt like it would be kind of a hole there to have the six foot high fence and this raised terrace. And it seemed like it would be nicer for the neighbors and for the view of the building to see it uh, landscaped instead. So we proposed to remove that fence. And then the fence that we're talking about, this is a, a small retaining wall, a short retaining wall. Mm -hmm. a fence that will go on top of that, which is the one that I just showed you the view of the horizontal cedar um, cedar one that we proposed to put on top of. Right. So we just we just saw the picture of that, which I think looks looks great. I don't I don't see any problem with that. Um, and then any changes in. Um, Sustainability measures at all? Not, not really. <laughs> so it's about the same as before. Um. Anyway, yeah. Are there maybe um, other members have questions about these changes from the last, you know, approval? see. I don't really have any questions. I think actually some things got um, cleaner looking and, and nicer. It's sometimes, you know, by accident that things get changed a little bit, but I, from what I see, it looks like they're nice changes. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, let's see, Alric. Um, I think I agree with David. I think, uh, I think uh, the changes of, are, are by and large, improvements um there's a there's a lot of scrutiny that's gone into it and i appreciate that and i think that uh the visible portions of the building um have been retained the only question i have i hadn't thought about this a year and a half ago but i looking at the building one thing that makes it so distinctive is those gang windows all the way around and the single shutters that that create those those horizontal features and i it, in reading the report from that period it said that the ones on the west side had been removed the ones on the east side were still there but were going to be removed and i just wonder um since it's the east side that's most visible if it's possible to leave them in place otherwise i think it's uh, uh, going to be an interesting uh, uh interesting facility and and uh um uh, i'm um, favorable. Thanks, Elric. Right. Right. So, uh, Kathy, our approval a year and a half ago, we approved it without the shutters on the side i can't i'm trying to remember <laughs> yes yes we um mm -hmm. we they were removed on the west side already and on this portion of the building that the university had owned um so these are all new in the front and they're fairly expensive shutters to add i mean as you can imagine because they're the double wide you know we're, we're matching them exactly the way they were historically and um um, and I think they'll be quite beautiful. Um, it was frankly a relief to the owner to think of not having to put them all down the east side just because there are a lot of them and they're not the simplest shutters to, you know, purchase to begin with and to maintain. So their preference was to not put them down th this side. Um, but that, sorry, yeah, this, this side, yeah. So that, that had been their preference and that's what had been approved last time, but. Well, and then it's really not part of this application. Um, I know pretty much the main part of this application is just the changes in the tower. Now that this is all going to the zoning department, um, zoning uh, board. So um, we're just going to write a memo um, whether, you know, uh, we support these changes. Um, my feeling is that these changes are pretty minimal. And like David and Elric said, um, you know, a lot of things got cleaned up. So, you know, I, I don't see any problems with it. Um, but I'm happy if other commission members have other comments. Um, go right ahead. This is Tom here. I mm -hmm. am delighted to see this plan again. 
the changes to me look fine. Uh, I just want to say generally how much I appreciate all the thought that's gone into this lovely project. Knowing the uh, webs as I do, and having seen Eitan and Giddy the other day in their so-called pop-up Shabbat house on Northern Tulane Street, I'm sure they're absolutely ecstatic about the possibility of getting back into this house and continuing the wonderful work they do to create family feeling and uh, fellowship. This building is going to be a tremendous asset to their work as it will be to the community. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, this plan advance and uh, looking forward to visiting the house myself. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, I guess if we could stop the screen sharing. Um, thank you. Um, anyone else? Shirley, Frida, Roger? The same feeling as Tom. As I understand it, um, the family will be living in one section and students will be living in another. Is that correct? And it will be a family unit for students who are at the university. So I think it's a really good plan. How many students? That's what I'd like to know. How many rooms are available for how many students? Um, the family will be living in the attic and on part of the second floor. The other half of the second floor, the first floor, and the basement is all for um, student use. And um, they have a lot of alumni. They have a lot of parents of students. They will just have two guest rooms in the basement, and they will be used by visiting students, often parents that will come in um, um, to stay for the weekend or something like that. Um, but they do host very large events on the first floor for particularly their Friday night Shabbat dinners, which is often 100 students. So it's very heavily used by the students. Okay. Thanks. Um, sorry, Elizabeth, I didn't see your hand up. There you go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have a question for um, Kathy. You talked about the mechanical equipment on the exterior, which is about two feet wide, comes in white. Um, is it possible to paint that a dark color, black, with a, with a powder coat finish, instead of it being white, just to make it less visible? Um, it comes in a factory finish white, which is desirable because I think the factory finish will last really well um, versus trying to paint it, you know, aftermarket. And, and I, I thought that the white might be very nice against the sky. Um, I, I don't know what your thought was, but I, I guess I envisioned that it might disappear more being light color than the dark color. Well, I, I think that typically we find that the dark color um, becomes less visible. But is that the only color that the factory? It is. I it did is on the white. check. They only make it in factory finish white. So we would be doing, having to do an aftermarket paint to it, which would just concern me how well that would last. I, I don't I don't know. Elric, do you have anything on this? Like whether it's white or on? Well, we have a color high? expert on our on our commission. Yeah, yeah, Frida. Frida. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I was just thinking about that. Um, I think because the white comes, you know, is the only factory finished color. I tend to agree with Kathy that I am not sure how painting it, you know, once you get it in, painting it, how that will hold up and you're adding more, um, you know, more maintenance. And it, it will look nice with the uh, the sky, the color of the sky. And they did take pains to uh, bring in that roofing material to kind of disguise it. So I'm not really concerned about it being white. All right, thanks, Frida. It's good to have a color expert. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, anything else? Um, and I wanna go uh, to Ed, oh, Elric, go ahead. I just, this has nothing to do with this application, except that I know that a lot of research has gone into it. Can you satisfy my curiosity after all these years about what the stone building immediately behind this was originally intended for? It is a university property. It's not part of our property. And right. I, I don't, I don't, I would love to know myself. I, I am not sure. There's a photograph in Connie Greif's book of the house which stood where the parking lot is now that belonged to Goldie. And I saw the name on, on this property from the, one of the early Sanborn maps. He was a university proctor, but I, I've, I've just been curious about that for all these years. Fill me in if anybody, if anybody learns anything. But anyway, thank you. Thank you for your time. 
All right. Thanks, Eric. Um, so, Ed, do you have enough to get a memo to the zoning board? Um, I mean, I I think we're unanimously uh, enthusiastic and approving of the project, and I I don't see any any issues at all. Uh, yes, we we have plenty. Uh, Dino, when do you go to the board? Do you know? I think you're you probably, trying to get there as soon as possible. Ed. I think Kathy um, was Derek trying to get us home for July sometime. Derek told us he'd try and get us in the, to the July, and we'd really appreciate it since we've started some of the um, demolition work. Sure, no, okay. no problem. We we can, we can get a memo drafted in the next week and get it out. Oh, thank, thank you Ed. very much. We really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Ed, and thank you so much for coming in. We really appreciate the work, and um, sounds like a great project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know. Bye. So we still have one more application. Um, this is for, let me get this right here. Um, 140. Yeah, one, 140 NASA Street. Um, we'll make sure we got the applicants. This is uh, coming over. Okay. Eric uh, Leipens. Yes, hi, good evening. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Um, do you have the rest of the people on, anyone else on your team needs to come over? I yeah, see, we... I see Harold is on. Um, I do know that someone from ownership was supposed to be as, uh, joining as well. His name is Israel. Yes. Okay. He's uh, been promoted and we're trying to get Melanie over as well. Okay, perfect. Oh, great. So maybe while we're doing that, um, Elizabeth, if you can go over your report um, briefly, that would be great. Sure. Okay, I think that she, I think they made it. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the applicant, Eric Lipens, has filed an application pursuant to the Borough Land Use Code to demolish existing storefront and build a new storefront and new signage. The site is identified as block 270.04, lot 28 on the Princeton tax map, and is further identified as 140 Nassau Street and located in the central business zone of the former borough. Uh, the property is located in the central historic district, um, and it also falls within two designated New Jersey National Register historic places, Princeton Historic District and the Kings Highway Historic District. This property also is designated in the overlay district as type two. And the application um, originally came in as administrative waiver um, because of demolition of the storefront. Um, it was required to meet the demolition noticing requirements. And I know that the noticing requirement was sent over to Ed. Ed, if you could just confirm that they've met all their requirements. Yes. Thank you. So the project site is situated on the north side of Nassau Street, mid block between Witherspoon Street and South Two Lane Streets. <coughs> if you look on the Sanborn map of 1890, which is the first one we have for Princeton, um, 140 Nassau is represented as part and attached to the building at 142 Nassau Street. It has a common wall with an opening access between the two sides. It's shown as a two-story frame building with a shingle roof and a two-story rear addition. The portion of the building for 140-42 Nassar was twice as wide and as deep than 140 and had a, about a three-quarter wide porch that was covered. And 140's Nassau footprint for the front portion of the building was almost square with a linear rectangular rear addition that also extended across the back of 142 Nassau. So the building went through several changes through the years. And by 1906, the front portion of the building was altered to a two and a half story with a shingled gabled roof. And for 140 Nassau at that time had a partially covered front porch. So both locations had different businesses, even residential uses and 
uh, which were identified on the Sanborn maps. But by 1911, 140 Nassau is re-identified on the map as a brick structure with a slate or tin roof. The front portion of the building is two and a half stories with a one-story rear addition. The street facade of 142 and the common wall with 140 Nassau is also noted as brick. So we don't know what happened there. Was there a fire? Did they just kind of redo it? Unknown. Um, so at this point, uh, the applicant wishes to construct a new storefront for the business for Ani Ramen House and um, Mochi. Um, Mochi. 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 At 140 Nassau, the storefront currently is recessed from the face of the building, providing four display windows and a covered entry. And you can see that on sheet A2 of the Zeltec design drawings. <coughs> Ceiling mounted lights illuminate the entrance and the storefront windows. And the storefront windows sit on low brick walls that match the brick on the face of the storefront of the building, sorry, which is painted white. Um, there's an exist, existing retractable awning which spans over the entire storefront. Uh, the display windows above low bricks, um, storefront walls, the research, recessed storefronts, and these entries, these are common um, type of um, elements that you see in other buildings within Nassau Street in the Central Historic District. So the current space at 140 Nassau supports a single business. Um, what the applicant would like to do is to create two entry doors because with their interior renovations, they're going to be creating two spaces. The one on the left side is going to be a smaller space for Machi, and the one on the right side is going to be for the Ani Ramen House. Um, and let's see. And so the, 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 um, the, the changes that are really for the storefront is that there is um, the distance from the face of the building to the entry right now is existing is seven feet, seven and a quarter inches. And the proposed is gonna be two feet and it's gonna be linear. As you know, on the existing, it kind of uh, juts in and that's why it has so many um, storefront windows, but this is just gonna be linear. Um, everything else, um, if you read on there, the door openings are gonna be the same for the new ones. Uh, there's going to be a new window system that's going to be custom designed just for this space. Uh, the storefront um, is going to be the same height and there's going to be a display area above the windows for a wall mounted sign. Um, new doors are going to have the architect classic hardware, which is a one inch round bent bar. It's going to be black anodized finish. And um, the existing retractable awning will remain. Um, it, but it will be reskinned with this umbrella in color black and sunflower yellow, which is the two logo colors of the two businesses. And there is new signage proposed. Um, I believe that the signage actually is not part of this review for HPC and the applicant should confirm that um, because I believe they came in with a, a blade sign, projecting sign, which the zoning officer had indicated that they couldn't place it there because it's actually on the adjacent property's um, face of the building. So my understanding was they were gonna take that off. So I don't know if we were gonna just review that administratively or not. So I'm gonna let the applicant um, discuss that with me. But all the other details, the signage I had reviewed with the zoning officer. And as far as uh, my review on that, I have no objections. It seems to meet all the criteria according to the ordinance. Um, and then just to go down to the general comments, um, the applicant is just asked to clarify um, the product sheet has 350 um, tough line and it has the 500 tough line, one which is a medium style and the other one has a wide style. So if you could just tell us which one um, you are proposing. Uh, the applicants asked also if there's any new lighting proposed. Um, I know that there was some ceiling lighting, if that's gonna remain or if they're gonna be removed and you're not gonna have any or you're gonna propose new. And if you have any sustainable measures incorporated into this application. Um, okay, you, thank Chair. you, Elizabeth. Thank you. I'd like to, yeah, say, um, she, for me, sheet A7 really helped in <laughs> understanding what the elevation is going to look like. Um, and they have a, a rendering um, 
of the of the new front elevation on A7. So that's that's helpful. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to the applicant and um, take it away. Sure. Thank you. So my name is Eric Leapins. I am the architect on the project. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for a great introduction. You've covered uh, all of the main points here uh, in this application. So I did just wanna quickly uh, get right to your comments, which are on the last page of your report. Uh, we will be using the 500 top line wide style. Uh, as far as the lighting, there are three recessed down lights, uh, which we intend to keep clean and relamp. Um, and those lights would fall in front of the new storefront system. So no, no, uh, material, no substantial change to that, just clean and relamp. And as far as any sustainable measures, um, you know, we did our best here to see what, what can we do for this application and, and um, the fabric awning structure is being kept. You know, we're trying our best to keep as much as possible, uh, reskin that and any of the brick that um, can be salvaged and reused when that knee wall is relocated, you know, we would, we would happily do so. Um, let's see. So as far as the signage, I would like, um, to talk and, and include the signage in this application minus the blade side. And we understand that that is, uh, being taken out of this application. And if that's something we'd want to go back for, we can resubmit, you know, with a new location, but I would like to at least, uh, discuss the signage if that's okay this evening. Um is that okay with you, Elizabeth? Sure, yeah. I mean, um, uh, as the applicant knows, we did go through a few generations of reviewing that application as we were looking at it as an administrative um, waiver. Um, I did look at all the detailing of it and it seems to, uh, as I stated, meet all of the signage requirements according to the ordinance. Um, typically as HPC um, commission, if they don't know, Typically signage is reviewed by myself and Julie as administrative review. Um, and we work with Derek on that because zoning has their own criteria. So we like to have the applicant do one stop shopping. You know, we, we review it together. When HPC signs off that way, zoning can sign off right away. He doesn't have to start looking at it again. So we try to incorporate all our comments together. But because there was more um, work on this, there were more interior changes, um, that's why I came in as an administrative waiver. Okay, so um, go ahead. Sure, so do you need me to touch and, and speak to any of the signage that's being proposed? Um, Madam Chair, maybe, I mean, if the, the, the commission has it's, any it's, questions, but I think it's pretty well, straightforward. Right. Yeah, I, like that sheet A7 that I was talking about, that has the signage on that elevation. So I think it's pretty clear what they're proposing. Yeah, and sheet um, A9 has a little bit more detail on the, okay. uh, on the tube structure, as well as the uh, dimensions as well. You know, just keep in mind that that blade sign at the bottom half of the page is omitted. Got it. All right, so do commission members have any general questions about the storefront design? Um, any, uh, any issues with that? Yeah, Frida? I, I don't have an issue. I just wondered why um, the one side has the orange door, the orange and black. Is it part of the branding? It is. It is. So orange and black is uh, the main color screen color scheme for Ani Raman House. Okay. All right. And the other store is called Mochi Nut? Yes, Mochi Nut, yep. Okay. And, um, right. So, I mean, I think it'll really fit in on NASA Street. I don't think there's anything unusual about it. Um, any, oh, David has a stand up, David? So as a, a, as a student of storefronts and downtowns, um, the configuration of storefronts and the things that people did with them over time to attract business is something that um, I hate to see lost. I, I think that the change at the Army Navy store where we lost that recessed entrance was 
was a mistake. And this angled entrance, someone put a lot of thought into at the time that it was done. And um, I feel like we're just kind of throwing that away without any conversation. So I'd be interested to hear what others have to say about that because it's a pretty big change and uh, it loses <laughs> character, I think. But I'd be interested to hear what other commission members have to say. Do, do you guys mind if I, if I just give a little bit of the thought process behind it? Oh, okay. please go ahead. Okay, so in essence, the, these are, are different concepts, right? One is like a, uh, a Japanese donut and the other one is a, is a ramen house, right? So they kind of complement each other because ramen house doesn't have any sweets and then you know it's right next door so it lends itself. Um, we found that after quite a few uh, maturations of, of this storefront, we found the most user-friendly way to optimize the space was to flatten it out to allow us, because the mochi nut space is only gonna be like maybe 400 feet. And if you have that indent, it becomes like maybe 280 feet, which almost makes it impossible to actually function inside the space. That was the, um, that was the premise because mochi nut is actually self-contained. And so it has its own hood and just like our bare minimum to, to actually work is like 500 square feet. I think it might be a little smaller, but if we, kept that indent, it would shrink it to almost 280, which would then uh, cannibalize the space. That was the, that was the practicality of it. I, I totally get the aesthetic portion of it, but that was the practicality of why it, it was adjusted. And if I could just follow up on that point that Israel had is, you know, currently there's one door with an indent on, on the left side of the storefront. And because there's two doors, that means that indent um, would basically carry the entire frontage and it would be set that much further back and there would be no portion of storefront at the street level. So the entry condition for both would be set quite far back without any show windows. You know, currently the Qdoba space has a show window that's closer to the street. Whereas if you had the two entrances like we're proposing that much further back, it kind of creates like a hidden, a hidden scenario here for both concepts, which of course is not something that um, you know, it would make ourselves quite hidden uh, and, and not, you know, attractive uh, as, as you're walking by. Yeah, Alric? Um, I think that, uh, first of all, I, I don't think that the, the loss of the angled entry um, is, a, is a particularly great one. It, I can remember when it was installed, it's, it's you know, that there's been a, there been a progression of, of interpretations of that, of that space. Also, the nature of the business, the businesses proposed are different from where you would have display on, um, of merchandise in the windows. In the case of, uh, of eateries, you're really, you're, you want to get the scent, you want to attract people to join in the in the people who are with the people who are already there and to get some sense of the ambience or whatever that lies beyond the window so for those reasons i have i have no objection to the to the uh, reconfiguration i wish that there was it was possible to have symmetricality between the two facades but i do recognize that the um, that it would diminish the space on the to the to the left Thank you. Anybody, Roger? In, in terms of Charlie? symmetricality, sorry. In, in terms of the symmetricality, which uh, our work just raised, um, I'm a little bothered by the fact that you're going to have building mounted signs there, and there, I don't. Is there a, is there a Could you turn up your I Roger? Can't hear a could thing. you turn up your volume? It's really low. Is that any better? Yep. A little Perfect. better. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not sure what's going on. Um, let me just look. All right, well, I'll try to speak louder. Um, no, I'm just a little concerned that the new uh, construction is going to have building mounted signs. And I don't know if 142, uh, the Fresca Bowls building has a building mounted sign. Currently, they both have awnings and signs on the awnings. I think most other businesses on Nassau Street, when they share a building, are symmetrical. I don't know if that troubles anybody else. It just uh, 
concerns me a little bit about the aesthetics. I mean, it's one building split between 140 and 142 with a, a door presumably to apartments in, in, in the middle. Um, and we're just going to have flat signs on one side and awning sign on the other. I thought it said the awning was going to be reused. Is, is the awning going to be reused? I think I thought oh, I read awning, that. The awning, the awning is, is reused, insane. but there's no signage on it. Okay, that's all right. The I didn't see that. I didn't understand that in the drawing. All right, the, and uh, I guess to say for the second time, never mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Shirley, you had a comment. Yes, I was busy looking at the renderings of all these big sheets. That um, my question is, what's being sold in the store? I'm not too sure. I know what's uh, what merchandise. Is it food or is it clothing? What what's being sold in the store, and what does the name that's mean? That's a very good question. Um, the being sold on the Ani Ramen side is Japanese izakaya. So, I mean, in layman's terms, it's going to be ramen with. Uh, Japanese small plates or, or izakaya is what they call it. So it's like, you know, we sell bao buns, we sell uh, chicken wings, edamame, shishito peppers in conjunction with rice bowls as, as well as uh, ramen, ramen noodles, right? Which you would uh, associate with that. Um, the, you know, our, our, you know, our price point is, you know, $9, $9 apps, at, you, know, you know, and our ramen bowls are right at the $15, $16 mark. And it's the goal is the goal is for us to be accessible to everybody. Like we want to be inclusive, not exclusive. So we want to have, uh, you know, we want to have high chairs for lunch. And, you know, if you want to go on a date, you can do that as well. And hopefully you'll come visit us more than once a week because we are not, we're price friendly, right? So that's, that's that one. That's Ani Rama, which will be on the, on the right side as you look at the storefront. And on the left side, which would be Mochi Nut, it is a Japanese donut. So it's like, uh, yeah. I don't know if you guys have ever had Krispy Kreme, but uh, if you, if Krispy Kreme and uh, a Zeppeli uh, fuse together, it gives you that type of texture, that kind of lightness. So it's not as heavy and rich. It's kind of more fluffy and, and, and dainty. And you could eat a few, a few of them without feeling too guilty. All right. So that's the goal. <laughs> well, for that. Okay. I mean, I, think, I honestly think like, I really, we were going to just do an Ani Ramen in Princeton and we really, I really pushed because I really thought the college students as well as, as well as that elevated community that you guys uh, are fortunate enough to live in or live by, um, I think it'll really, it'll, they'll appreciate it. They'll really like the, the nuance of the donut as well as the ramen. So one side is your meal, the other side is your dessert. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. That's exactly you. Hey, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. So I'm not, not going to talk anymore. I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> well, I think it's always exciting to have the um, new stores come to Princeton, and it does especially uh, revitalize the community. And having something that's not super expensive is very welcome. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing, you know, I, I like in this, especially in this economic environment, the goal is to make it make you, you know, make repeat offenders, right? And, and so we can, and then also the good part is that you don't even have to get ramen if you don't want to, because there's enough small plates and uh, izakaya that you could literally have a, a great meal without, if, you're, if ramen isn't your thing, you don't have to get it, you'd still be satisfied. Julie, this raises yes. an important question. Does this application then, being a new donut shop in town, have to be approved by a police department? <laughs> I, I will absolutely. They will. They will. I hope, I hope, we, I hope. They just come by once. We'll be approved. <laughs> we, we have to ask our council if he has any uh, intel. If he has any intel on that. You know, you know, uh, I, I just I think this is a win win for the community. You know, we just uh, passed the SID special improvement district. Right. And I think one of the things that that Princeton has the opportunity now is to be even more eclectic than we are. I think diversity is is wonderful for for what we're doing in the central business district. Uh, we have a chance. We have a real chance now 
uh, with the current uh, mayor, the, the current council to move forward with smart growth and wise choices. And while this is just, you know, like, like Shirley said, uh, dinner and dessert, this, this, this is part of, I think, the process that we even if painstakingly go through to be really a, a, a great little small city. And, um, you know, I thank you for your application. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the structure of Nassau Street is critically important. And I, and I get the, the difference of the entrances too. I think that, you know, under the best circumstances, it probably will be great to keep it symmetrical. But in this case, you know, we see where uh, the need of something to be done to keep diversity and inclusivity and to give us a different look and a different feel. And we're, we're making the compromise uh, in, in what our outward structure is here in Princeton uh, for the betterment of, I think, of our inner soul going forward. So, so congratulations to everybody. Congratulations to everybody on this call. And thank Ed Schmier for um, you know, the good work you're doing as, as, as a legal representative. Thank you. Really thank you, Councilman Newland. <laughs> Yeah, we really appreciate your time and your efforts on, on our behalf because um, we're excited to be here and and being welcomed is, it means a lot because we haven't always been welcomed. So it's nice to, it's nice to, to start this way. <laughs> well, that's great. Now, now, on this application, I think we would need a motion and a vote. Um, is anyone prepared to do that? No one wants to make a motion. I say so moved. Is, is that like a motion? Yeah, that works. Okay. okay. I, I think I saw Elric second. A second. Okay. So it's been moved by Shirley, seconded by Elric to the approve the application without the blade sign, but with the signage included um, as presented. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to take a roll call? Of course. Ms. Capazzoli? Yes. Mr. Shore? I'm going to vote no. Mr. Endersby? Yes. Ms. Satterfield? Yes. Mr. Shatskin? Yes. Can I keep going? Ms. Howard? Yes. Mr. Pyle. Yes, please. Well, thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sad about the 10 pounds I'm going to gain after I go to the place. <laughs> Only 10? You're going to put on more than that. <laughs> but it sounds like it's, I used to live in Japan. It's, I know it's delicious. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm excited to host you guys. And, and, and I want to make sure that I get everybody's information. Um, and Julie, do you can you possibly so that I can invite you guys to friends? Is that a possibility? Oh, that's so sweet. Why don't you talk to Elizabeth? Okay, I will talk to Elizabeth. Perfect, one hundred percent. She's our, she's our. Got it. I'll talk to Elizabeth. Got you. No problem. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Thank you so much. You appreciate. And uh, you good luck. Good luck. Good Thank luck. you very much. Have a great really night. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Enjoy this weather. You don't yeah. too. Thank you. Oh, oh, he left. I said something to say to him, but that's okay. Oh, I'll get him. <laughs> You'll get him at the opening. Right. I want him to, I want to do an article about him in the Witherspoon Jackson Historical and Cultural Society. Oh, well, then Elizabeth has his contact info. So if you can't, you can connect each other. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and surely also on the application is his email address. If you want to come back, but I can give it to you. All right. So we have moved to, um, thank you everyone. That's the end of our applications. And we have moved to public comment. And I'm just wondering, I think we have, do we have anyone from the public? Uh, yeah, uh, we have um, Ms. Kerr, but Madam Chair, um, do you want to just defer Morningstar until after public comment? 
We can do that. We can switch it. Oh, uh, yeah. If we okay. could, that probably would make sense. Um, um, should I promote Mr. Yeah, thank you. Nora, we're going to promote you to panelist. Welcome. Good evening. This is uh, Jack and Nora Kerr. Um, we're both on together and uh, we're using her computer, so you see her name. Um, we're here this evening on behalf of the Mercer Hill Historic District Association. Earlier today, we delivered a letter to the commission with respect to the plans of the Princeton Theological Seminary to demolish the former uh, Hun School campus on Stockton and Hibben, and, and specifically the Tenet Hall, Roberts Hall, and Whiteley Gymnasium. Uh, and I guess my initial question and comment is, is whether the commissioners have had a chance to look at that letter. Um, we were not allowed to distribute the letter until you read the letter. So, until basically we're not we're not allowed to give it out as um, like application material. So if you want to go ahead and read the letter after you do that, then we can get a copy to everyone on the commission. All right. I'll, I'll read the letter. It's two pages. I'll, I'll read the important parts and summarize uh, some of the more technical parts. Okay. So it's a, it's a letter uh, from the Mercer Hill Historic District Association addressed to the members of the Princeton Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, Princeton Theological Seminary has an application pending with the town of Princeton to demolish the former Hun School campus located at the intersection of Stockton Street and Hibben Road. The three principal buildings of this campus, Tenet Hall, Roberts Hall, and Whiteley Gymnasium are important historical buildings cited as warranting status as key contributing buildings to the Princeton Historic District by Watts and Henry, PTS's own preservation consultants. While PTS's application for demolition indicates there is no plan to redevelop this site, it is public knowledge that PTS has contracted to sell the site to a developer Herring properties, apparently after demolishing the buildings on it. This egregious two-step strategy removes planning board review of the demolition application. Actively moving ahead with its project plans, Herring Properties has already retained a public relations firm to organize by invitation only and with the promise of anonymity, focus group to discuss its redevelopment of the site. Now I'm going to ask Nora to continue reading this because this gets into some areas that she is more familiar with. Thank you. In, in 2019, when PTS was proposing to redevelop the tenant Roberts Whitley buildings, which we have short, we call for short TRW, um, uh, to create a married student, student housing on the campus, the HPC conducted an advisory review of the proposed redevelopment. In a February 4th memorandum, 2019 memorandum to the planning board, the HPC found that the tenant campus comprising the three halls Jack mentioned is historically and architecturally significant. This historic complex of buildings was constructed in the 1920s for the Hunt School and designed by Rolf Bonn of of the first graduate of Princeton University School of Architecture who designed approximately 70 houses in town and was responsible for the renovation of more than 150 buildings in Princeton. His papers are in the collection of the Historical Society of Princeton. The Tenant Campus is located within the Princeton Historic District listed on the State and National Register of Historic Places. 
It is not in the Mercer Hill Historic District, but it contributes to the his, it to it is not in the Mercer Hill Historic District, but the buildings contribute to the Merc to the Princeton Historic District, and are included in the community master plan as a suggested extension of the Mercer Hill Historic District. In February four, in, in its February 4th, 2019 memo, the HP to the ad hoc committee, the HPC strongly recommended that the tenant campus be preserved in its current ap appearance, fronting Stockton Street and Hibben Road. The HPC also noted that the campus green is a significant feature of the tenant and <coughs> former Hun School campus and recommended the street streetscape be preserved. In May in a May 28, 2019 follow-up memo to David Cohen, chair of the ad hoc committee, uh, the HPC referring to its recommendation of a feasibility study on adaptive reuse of TRW wrote the demolition this is from the HPC to D David Cohen, the demolition of historic buildings with long ties to the history of Princeton presents an irrevocable loss to the community and should not be accepted without much more rigorous review. So I'll continue from there. Um, it, it, the letter goes on to say the town has done nothing to explore the adaptive reuse of these buildings and seems content to allow them to be demolished. Councilman Cohen recently stated publicly that tenant Roberts and Whiteley buildings are not historic, flatly contradicting the HPC and PTS's own historic preservation consultants. The town designated these buildings as part of an area in need of redevelopment in 2018 with the consent of PTS, thus conferring on these properties a special legal status that requires the town to be engaged in and approve any proposed redevelopment plan for the properties. Surely the town has the authority to delay or prevent demolition to permit exploration of adaptive reuse as part of a plan of redevelopment. In your recent review of the application for the demolition and redevelopment of 39 Linden Lane, located in another historic district, suggested historic, suggested historic district, thank you, the Tree Streets Historic District, you cite the provisions of MLUL section 4055D-110, which provides your commission review, which provides that your commission review every application submitted to the planning or zoning boards for development of properties located in historic zoning districts, as well as in suggested historic districts. The PTS herring strategy is to avoid proper review by separating demolition plans from plan review and should not be allowed. We urge HPC to do something. As the town's commission charged with identifying and safeguarding Princeton's historic buildings and neighborhoods, we urge you to make your views expressed publicly in 2019 make them known to the current mayor and current council members, some of whom were elected subsequent to 2019, as well as to the public. Time is of the essence and action is needed to forestall the impending demolition of these significant and historic buildings that frame the Western Gateway to Princeton. Respectfully submitted, Marissa Hill Historic District Association by Tom Chapman, Jack Kerr, Nora Kerr, Jane McLennan, Christopher Olson, and Carolyn Robertson. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you. Um, so um, uh, let's see. I just as an aside, um, maybe Linden Lane isn't the best example because they demolished the house before we were able to review the application. So. <laughs> I don't know if I'd use that one as an example. Well, it was just the language of your report that cited that MLUL provision that was just in the news recently. It wasn't clear from the right. report that it had already been demolished or it wasn't clear from yeah, the they Well, we didn't, we didn't even know that it had been demolished until after we got the application. Yeah. Um, well, so Elizabeth, this is, did a, you... this is a sort of strategy that shouldn't be allowed. You know, Elizabeth, did you have any comment or 
And then David? Well, I, I think that um, it is obvious that there are plans for some development. Um, Unfortunately, I believe the way that the ordinance and maybe the MLU, I don't know, maybe Ed could shed light on this, that an applicant can, you know, can, can kind of circumvent that review by HPC, whether it be courtesy um, by requesting demolition first. Um, and as Julie was saying that, you know, it did happen in Linden. Um, was it intentional? I don't know. Um, but I think that it is um, apparent that this is a way that um, property owners can have demolition done. And then obviously if there's a review by HPC, there's nothing there to review because it's already been demolished. Right. And, David? And that's, that's her point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's shouldn't be allowed. Exactly, exactly the issue. And I, I take issue that, you know, uh, Linden Lane or whatever it was, is not exactly a good example. It's a perfect example. Um, this is a this is an important property, I think, in, in two ways that have been said many times before me, but the significance of the architecture and the significance of that open space, uh, part of our gateway coming into a town that's known for being all about education, a big educational campus where you see students and people playing on it. You know, not that you could always have that same use there because I guess it is going to change, but to not have a discussion about um, what's important there and how it's going to be in some way um, translated into what, what happens there next is very important. And um, I, I thank the Mercer Hill people for getting together and trying to bring this to everyone's attention. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, um, let's see first, Roger, and then Elric. Um, I'd have to. Uh, I guess I have to defer to Ed on this. I don't know, since it's an area of need of, in need of redevelopment still, whether um, what kind of status we have. I don't think. I'm guessing it's not the same kind of status, even though it's a proposed. A, a potential district once it's in this ANR status it changes as far as we're concerned and the second thing I would say I uh, is, I believe there's supposed to be a public meeting on this on the 27th is that a council meeting Leighton uh, this is coming up at that later in the month uh, I believe a discussion uh, uh, I'm, I'm actually I may have to defer to Ed. I'm not exactly sure how this is going to come up on uh, the agenda, and I would have to defer to Dolores, but it was under discussion. Well, I, I would say I, I have not everybody on the commission, like the council was here in 2019, but I, I'd be uh, very comfortable resubmitting our correspondence that we wrote to the ad hoc committee to the council, uh, put that in the mix. Uh, that would get our concerns uh, up front. I think there were, uh, Elizabeth circulated those memos fairly recently. Uh, I think there were three separate memos. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. All right. Uh, thanks, I, Roger. Elric. Yeah. I first of all, clarification: it is part of the the Kings Highway Historic District, isn't it? At one of the meetings, David Cohen said that the setback was sufficient that it wouldn't be impacted by the, it, it wouldn't impact the Kings Highway Historic District. Well, that might be true of the of tenant, but the other two certainly are within the 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 distance from the from the road, I would think. But anyway, as as the Historic Preservation Commission, I don't see how we could hold our heads up high if we didn't get involved in this and 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 act as um, you know, try to try to put the brakes on the on this uh, on this unfortunate development um, and potential literal potential development, which is undefined and and uh, you know it's you know it's one of those things where it's easier to ask 
to ask forgiveness than permission um, that, that, to wipe the slate clean and then say, oops, well, we should probably might have put this before the community before we did this. It's a, a great error. And uh, let, let's make a point of getting involved. I just want to defer to Ed because I think Ed can tell us where we have the legal rights to get involved and how we can. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, the HPC uh, will review and does review on a regular basis developments, applications for development that occur within local designated historic districts. That's what that uh, chapter, that section 110 of the municipal land use law that gives you the jurisdiction to hear the application like you did this evening for the new store. And, and you can make decisions about historic preservation, you can make decisions about demolition, but the precursor to doing that is your jurisdiction is limited to developments, applications for development, not applications for demolition, but applications for development that occur within a designated historic district. Roger had indicated, and I think the letter also correctly indicates that there was a study done of this area, and there was a, uh, a finding that it was an area in need of redevelopment. But that only lays the foundation for a redevelopment plan. A redevelopment plan for this property was never developed, never implemented. So. The study is the basis for that. The next step from the governing body would have been to actually move forward and to come up with a redevelopment plan. We don't have a redevelopment plan for this property. So the, the limited scope, uh, as much as you may, as because you care about historic preservation in the community, but there's a limited scope of your jurisdiction in terms of what you can do officially as the Historic Preservation Commission. And you have to be guided by what the state law tells you you can do and what has been implemented in the local ordinance for you to do. And, and I, I, you, you, you may feel individually strongly because you take very seriously your commitment to historic preservation in Princeton, but you have to be careful that there are other rights uh, in play. And if the demolition process is one that is overseen by law, by the, depart the construction department, then you have to be guided by what the construction department can or can't do. I think it's fine. And if, if uh, the comment is that there's gonna be a community discussion or dis debate or, or even a presentation uh, where the Kurs can attend the town meeting on next Monday and read this letter into the record and, and, and request and suggest that there be a forum to discuss or redaptive reuse, et cetera. All of that can be done, but there's nothing that the Historic Preservation Commission as a commission, if you take a look at our local ordinance and the state law that is the basis for that local ordinance, there's nothing that the Historic Preservation Commission has jurisdiction over. If I could make a couple of points in response. Um, when these properties were declared by the town as an uh, area in need of redevelopment, um, it took on the responsibility as it's required to do, as I understand it, under the, under the statute to lead the process to come up with a redevelopment plan. And it had the input of, of the, the, the seminary as the owner and, and proposed developer back in 2018 uh, and the community at large. And there were a number of hearings and meetings and HPC had an advisory role in that process. And that was why these, these memoranda we've referred to from 2019 were generated. And HPC articulated, I think, very eloquently the importance of these buildings and, and why it was important to uh, consider adaptive reuse as part of the plan. The seminary decided not to go forward with the plan for various reasons of its own and decided instead to sell the property. There's now a new developer 
on the field. Uh, it's, it's public knowledge. He's announced his tentative plans to put uh, uh, townhouses or apartments in this place. But the, the town uh, is required to take the lead in coming up with a redevelopment plan and it has to ultimately be approved by the planning board and the town council. Once it's an ANR, it, the, the, the legal status of the property is different from simple ownership. And it's, it's our, it seems logical to us that clearing the site, demolishing these buildings is really step one in the redevelopment. Um, and by, by separating the application for demolition from the re redevelopment process, it seems like an artificial way to eliminate adaptive reuse as a possibility from the town's consideration of a redevelopment plan. Well, the, the, the difference I would uh, uh, indicate is that it's not, and it never was, the seminary's ability or authority to take step two. And that is after the initial study was done and a recommendation was made to continue, can consider this as an area in need of redevelopment, number, the second step is to have the governing body, not the property owner, but the governing body, move forward with the creation of a redevelopment plan. That step two was never taken by the governing body or any governing body here in Princeton. So that decision was made by the elected officials of this community not to proceed, certainly in consultation, I would imagine, with the seminary. But the, the, the decision to move forward or not move forward is not the decision of the property owner, but rather the decision of the elected officials and the governing body, and that never happened. Why didn't they receive ready? How could that be? Yeah, we understood well, that the we, we, we don't have, if, if it was moved forward, there would be an actual redevelopment plan, not a recommendation to create one, but you can't find a redevelopment plan that was implemented after the initial recommendation to do so. And there was a decision made, presumably by the governing bodies between from, from 2019 forward, not to move forward with a formal redevelopment plan and designate a redeveloper. Mm -hmm. I don't believe has happened. I'm quite sure it hasn't happened. But so, the decision was actually the the seminary's decision to withdraw its project, its, its proposal, and so that the the the, the town never released any any statement that it had made a decision. The seminary just stepped back. Well, I and then and then the seminary in marketing the property to Herring Properties essentially. It's the seminary designated the developer. It's a, it's it just seems to be a very strange uh, process, and well, it, it, it it may be, but it is a process, and the process goes from a study that took place uh, back in 2018, 2019, so whether or not this should be designated an area in need of rehabilitation under the law, and then if that study was acceptable to both the planning board and a recommendation back to the governing body, the next step would have been to prepare an actual redevelopment plan. Not to have a study about a redevelopment plan, but to have a redevelopment plan. And that's where the process came to a halt. So there is no redevelopment plan for this property. I, I, that, I think that is a correct statement. And, and the, the town has not move this forward and is, uh, I think, deferring to the, the owner. But just to comment on what's coming up at, uh, at, at, at council, as I understand it, uh, next a week from tonight, uh, the, the tenant Roberts campus is on the agenda, but it's, as I understand it, solely for the purpose to consider a request from the uh, Princeton Coalition for Responsible Development for the town to rescind the ANR designation and and return this to its historical zoning and 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 let the developer 
come up with a plan within the context of the current zoning. So it's not really addressing uh, the demolition issue, which we understand uh, is imminent. It will, the, the buildings are scheduled for demolition this summer. But Mr. Kerr, do, during the course of the meeting on the 27th, if there is a very narrow, limited issue to be addressed by the governing body, either in a work session or otherwise, that's fine. But you and the other people in town who want to be heard on the demolition issue are certainly uh, entitled to be heard during the public comment section of the council meeting. So you'll be given every opportunity to either read this letter or make any statements that you may like to make to the governing body. You'll be given that opportunity, that's the law. Well, I wanna thank um, the Kerrs for coming to our meeting. I wanna thank Ed for clarifying this issue. I think that clearly this is a bigger issue than the HPC, but we can all be interested and involved citizens here. And um, so I think that the next step is just uh, the, the forum for the council, however that may present itself. So thank you, Ed. Thank you for, for clarifying that. And thank you everyone for your comments. Thank so you for your time, your time thank and you. consideration. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. So um, Elizabeth, do we have any other members of the public waiting to speak? You're, you're on mute, so. <laughs> Sorry, um, no one else's hand is up, but maybe we'll give them a minute to see if someone wants to raise their hand and speak. Um, okay. There's two people in the public. Okay, so we'll wait a minute. And um, that's, that's and then do you have know, any? I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I didn't know if you want to circle back to other matter for the Morning Star to see if there's any update. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's see if there's uh let's see. So no one, would no it be Shirley? Okay. Um Shirley, do you know anything about the Morning Star property? No, I saw um Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. I know he's gotta go. <laughs> sorry. Bye, Ed. Thank you. Thank you for staying for that. We really appreciate it very much. Thank you. I saw Elder Bynes about three weeks ago. Um, he visited one of his parishioners and I asked him about it and he has no information as of yet. So, mm -hmm. um, so I have no idea what's going on. Um, I just know that the um, small pr uh, praise house is going to be demolished, but um, I don't know anything after that. Do you, do you know if the, um, the Woodison Jackson I think he talks with the municipality and then we'll find out. Maybe he, someone has talked to Leighton, but I haven't heard anything since we spoke with Elder Bond. And Shirley, do you know, does the, um, does the what is from Jackson Historical and Cultural Society, are they interested in that? We are interested, yes, but we can't make any move until we find out what's going on um, on Elder Bond's end. But yes, we are interested. Leighton, did you okay. have any update? Uh, uh, I, I, I do know that Elder Bynes is just still waiting for some, uh, some information before he, he and his congregation, which is a very small congregation, but he and I believe his bishop make the decision. But I did talk to him about a week and a half ago. He said that he's, you know, uh, they're just waiting for, I think, some financial information, property value information, appraisal stuff. Got it. Thank you. Damn Thanks bye. a lot. We appreciate, okay. we appreciate you staying with this. All right. So as soon as we know, you'll know. Thank you. That's right. great. Thank you. I know it's a difficult moving target. So it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um anything let's see do you have any staff report anything no thank you madam just, just so you know our next meeting is in july let me just pull up the date 18th. um is it the 18th 
Yes. Okay. So July 18th, I know a lot of people travel in the summer, but I'm hoping we can get a quorum. <laughs> Do we have much on the agenda, Elizabeth? Um, it's filling up. <laughs> it's filling yeah. up. So we have one concept. Okay. We have the, um, the Center for Theological Inquiry. That's scheduled. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have my draft in front of me, but it's, it's getting pretty full. It's all right. All right. So <laughs> hopefully if you do have to be gone, just let Elizabeth know um, so we can make sure we have a quorum. Um, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think I have anything else. So if not, um, yes, Tom. I'd like to just make a personal reflection. Um, last month, we lost our son uh, to the uh, uh, vagaries of his illness, schizophrenia, and the HBC and others in the community have been so kind and with their expression of love and support and their attendance for uh, our memorial service and donations in his memory. So I want to just thank all of my colleagues on the HBC for their expressions of support. Uh, we're past the spontaneous weeping stage, I suppose. We're moving into the sort of permanent ache phase, but with um, uh, we are uh, very grateful for all the love and support that's helping us get through this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Um, well, I appreciate everyone coming today. Um, a lot going on in town. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, in July, if not sooner. So is there a motion to adjourn? Looking at me. <laughs> I second. <laughs> OK. All in favor? Thank you all. Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Thank you so much. Bye, Take guys. care. Bye. See you soon. Good night. Good meeting. Bye. Bye. And Bye. hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah. All right. Peace out.